2021 speaker series. Um, I first wanted to tell you about African African American studies. Like many Black Studies departments around the country, we emerged as part of the 1960s civil rights movements when students around the country were getting mobilized. And today, ironically, we face the same global movement against anti-Black violence that we see sweeping the world and resistance to abolishing that. And hence, Walter Johnson's talk is extremely appropriate looking historically at black violence. And particularly for those of us who are situated in, the, in St. Louis, this has a particular importance coming out of the heels of Ferguson. Our mission of black studies is to critically understand the black experience and cultural productions using an interdisciplinary approach. We invite you to our, the rest of our speaker series. I will put that in the chat. And I would now like to turn it over to our chair of this speaker series, Shawande Mustakim, who has put together a brilliant series that is taking advantage of this election as well as kind of key moments. Shawande? Okay, welcome. Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Again, we welcome you. Dr. Johnson, again, it's an, it is an honor. I am really excited to be tasked with the introduction. I am the chair of the speaker series this year. It's really exciting to be in this role and begin to bring astounding intellects into our space and across the world. So again, it's an honor to introduce Dr. Walter Johnson, who is the Winthrop Professor of History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He is a native of Missouri. He grew up in Columbia, Missouri. But what really brings him here is many things, but it is also because of his 2020 book that is bringing us to this moment where Violence in its many contexts, racial, imperialism, capitalist, looking at the historical evolution that brings us to now. He has, he has written many prize-winning books, Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market, that came out in 1999, as well as his 2013 book, River of Dark Dreams, Slavery and Empire in the Mississippi Valley's Cotton King. But again, today, we are here to begin to engage and learn from being here in St. Louis and beyond, because we understand the center point here within the nations right here in the center, in St. Louis, to understand the fundamental book that he has written, The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States, which again was published this year. And it is about making us think about the historical evolution structurally, but also in place that has gotten us to where we are, where the racial dynamics are very segregated. So again, I want to point out that actually our talk is going to go, or I'm sorry, that the event will go until 530. So I'm keeping my um, introduction brief. But again, I want to go ahead and welcome Dr. Johnson, Dr. Walter Johnson. Again, it's an honor for to share you with St. Um, to share you with Washington University in St. Louis. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Wande, um, for your work on putting this together. Um, it's it's really nice to be um, to have a chance to talk with folks in St. Louis and in WashU, and I I regret that I haven't been able to be there over the the last several months. I've I've really um, longed for I mean long is a very strong word, but I've really um, wanted to to be in dialogue with people, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, there are several figures at WashU, Wash Peter Castor, Gerald Early, Michael Allen, Bob Hansman, Ivor Bernstein, Heidi Pope, Douglas Flo, whose, whose work has um, on St. Louis figures directly in the book. And so I wanna, I wanna thank them. And, and I wanna thank um, Jeff Ward and Linda Samuels at WashU, who, with whom I'm scheming up a course for the spring, a shared course. So I, I maybe will have a chance to to be in a little bit more communication with some of you all, and also um, Tuff Poe, Kalila Jackson, and Nicole Nelson, who are sort of my, my stalwarts in St. Louis. Um, the book intellectually owes a lot to George Lipsitz, David Rodiger, uh, Keon Irvin, uh, Clarence Lang, um, 10 or 12 other historians who've done um, fantastic work on St. Louis. So I, again, um, you know, I, I want to, to be particularly scrupulously honest about my enormous indebtedness 
to um, to people in St. Louis, um, both for for their scholarly work, but but also for their example and their their um, your um, generosity with me. Um, what I thought maybe I would do is just talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes um, about what I, I hope to, you know, what I think the book does um, and try and open up a couple of the terms, particularly um, maybe talk a little bit about what I mean by structural racism and, and racial capitalism. Um, but I'd really, um, I'd love to, to hear from you all. Um, for a long time in my mind, this book was, I, I thought of this as a history of St. Louis between, um, between Lewis and Clark and Michael Brown, between the, um, the Louisiana Purchase and the Ferguson Uprising. And those, um, that framing, I think, analytically draws attention to what I think is, is going on in the book. The book is largely pitched around the question, or at least the, the first half of the book is pitched around the question of the relationship between the history of empire and anti-blackness in the United States. And so trying to think through the history of that relationship um, and, and to learn from that relationship, because I don't think, and this is just a larger commitment of mine, I don't think um, we can imagine a, um, a politics, an, an anti-racist politics or an anti-capitalist politics that's not always already an anti-imperialist politics. And so part of that is a, is a foundational commitment that I have to how I think about history and how I think about, about justice. Um, it is a history of, of white supremacy, of racial capitalism, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by racial capitalism in the middle, but also a history of, of racial resistance and what I think that, that I would want to call a history of the black radical tradition in St. Louis. And um, it is, in the end, an effort to, um, I think, vindicate the idea that that, that, is, that that is a tradition rather than a series of responses to, um, to white supremacist provocation. Um, and finally, it's the history of a place. It's the history of, of St. Louis. Um, for me, a place that I try to think about as being um, material, ecological, economic, a place that is composed of social relations. And, and I try to think in the book um, very, very, uh, I mean, I, I don't wanna say rigorously because it's up to you all whether or not you think it's rigorous, but, it, but repeatedly, let's just say I try to think repeatedly about the structure of the physical environment in the city of St. Louis and of, of life within it. Um, and I think from there, it, it opens a bit out into a, um, an environmental history in a way that's not, not fully manifest in the book that I'd be interested in talking about with you and questions if, if you're interested. A very, very simple question framed a lot of that, which is how is it that a place can be racist? And what I mean by that is how is it that a history of um, racial domination and, ex and economic exploitation can become so embedded in the physical fabric of, of our lives that, that that physical space itself is uh, dominative and lends itself to exploitation. I want to say at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm, I'm from Missouri enough to know <laughs> that, that, you know, there's an immediate suspicion and resentment of people who come in from say, um, I don't know, say Boston and um, try and tell everybody, you know, what they think is, is wrong with Missouri on the basis of their experience in Boston. And so I want to be very clear that, first of all, I tried to write this book 
as a book that was really about me rather than about them. And I really do think that these are questions that, that um, have, have deeply problems and a history that deeply shaped my life. I'll just speak strictly for myself on that, right? And so this is a, a book that, that I don't think about as being about someone else. I also think of it as a book about the United States. And so I do think that St. Louis is um, particularly exemplary in, in its history, um, extreme perhaps in its history, but that these are the material and ideological um, features of, of economic and racial and imperial life in the United States. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's in that spirit that I, I wrote the book. The book begins with, um, well, the book begins with um, the, the Mississippian people, the mound builders. Um, and, and just to, to note, to, to insist upon that prior history, the prior history of the Mississippi Valley and the prior history of the continent, um, to begin to understand um, the, the, what is, is the received history, the American history as an imperial history. So it begins with the idea of empire. And, um, and it thus understands everything that happened um, in, in North America that we think of as being um, American history, as being an imperial history, as being a history that is framed by um, foundational expropriation and extermination, and for me then, by the history of racial capitalism from the very beginning. Um, I really start, pick up that story with um, Lewis and Clark and the kind of United States of America's reconnaissance mission through the territory purchased from France and the Louisiana purchase. Um, and I try to tell the story that has been told um, by several others, including Peter Castor so well, Stephen Aaron is another, about the fur trade world and about how it was that, a, that, that Lewis and Clark's expedition really was a expedition carried out on native ground um, and how it was that that territory was gradually and violently um, wrested from, from Indian control. Um, and that involved then moving on to a long history of Indian removal, of war on the plains, much of which was overseen from St. Louis and much of which was in its, in, you know, up until the 1830s overseen by William Clark was the United States Superintendent of Indian Affairs from 1822 to 1838 and in sitting in St. Louis. And the, that history was made and enforced by the United States Army, um, which was headquartered, um, the Department of the West of the Army was headquartered at, at Jefferson Barracks for the entire period before the Civil War. And so it's my contention that the history of St. Louis was a hub of, of Western Empire, of Indian removal, and of um, genocide. One of the central arguments of the book is that that imperial, that anti-Indian removalism was carried over in the attitude of many of the white migrants to Missouri, carried over in their attitude towards African Americans. Um, and this involves trying to, to outline a contrast in what, what I come to call a Western model of anti-Blackness to a Southern model of anti-Blackness. And, and I think the easiest way to think about that would be to think about the, the, the fact that the, the history of slavery is a history of white supremacy and anti-Blackness, but of a anti-Blackness that is pro-natalist. Slaveholders in the American South recognize that the social reproduction of their society, the furtherance of slaveholder, slaveholding over time is dependent upon the biological reproduction of enslaved people. 
is dependent upon sexual and reproductive control. Um, something about which many, including um, Shawande, have written um, important and insightful, importantly and insightfully. Um, I argue that there is a very, very powerful strand of thought in Missouri and in the West that is a white non-slave holding strand of thought that emphasizes the necessity of the removal and occasionally the extermination of black people. In many instances, this is anti-slavery and anti-black thought. It is, it comes out of a particular class experience of non-slave holding Southern whites who believe that they have been ill done by the slave holding aristocracy of the Eastern states. And I try to trace that anti-black removalism through the subsequent history of St. Louis really up to the present day. Um, that begins with a rereading of the Dred Scott case and a, um, a reading of the Dred Scott case in light of the Missouri State Constitution of 1820 and which, which um, focused on that there, were, there was a provision in the Missouri State Constitution of 1820 that focused on the exclusion of free black people from the state of Missouri. And there were a series of state laws in the years leading up to the Civil War that were likewise um, designed to excise, um, deterritorialize, remove free black people from the state of Missouri. And so I try then to see how the idea of the white man's country produced a or allowed a kind of generalization of the techniques of removal pioneered in relationship to Na Native Americans onto African Americans in the West. Um, I, I, I exemplify this in various ways, in very, very convenient ways, in the words of Frank Blair, who was at the time that he said this, uh, St. Louis's representative in the United States House of Representatives. The races of the continent could only flourish if separately from one another. Whites in the temporally central latitudes, blacks in the tropics, and Indians pressed out to the margins. So there's a strain of white supremacist, imperialist, anti-slavery that I think becomes um, central to, I, I, I probably would go ahead and say the backbone of the free soil wing of the Republican Party during the Civil War. Um, the theme of removal, a succession of removals runs through the book, right? The, the removalism of the Dred Scott decision, the 3,000 of the black residents of East St. Louis in 1917 at the time of the East St. Louis massacre, the driving out of 20,000 black St. Louisans from uh, Mill Creek Valley in 1959, the driving out and destruction of the of the Pruitt Igo housing project, and then finally the the kind of the cantonment, the the um, and and increasing um, incarceration of the black residents of of St. Louis, um, epitomized by the Ferguson uprising. So there's a way then that the book is framed around a kind of a repetition of removalist white supremacy. But what I wanted to, to emphasize in order to help you understand what I mean by racial capitalism is that each one of those removals is framed by a different set of political economic imperatives by a different way of trying to make black people or the space they occupy valuable. And so the argument that I'm trying to make about racial capitalism is that there is at once a history of a repetition of white supremacy 
And at the same time, there's a dialectical transformation of the terms of what it means to be black and of the way that people are trying, white people are trying to, to monetize um, the space, are trying to, to expropriate or exploit black people. So in East St. Louis, that's the history of, of the dual labor market and of white supremacist unions that or, organize only white workers and thus when they go on strike are confronted by um, African-American workers whom they have failed to organize, whom they have you know, excluded from their unions, um, moving into their jobs in the plants. And that's a, you know, a foundational story of, of the, um, the underlying, the, the framing conditions, the framing history of the East St. Louis massacre. In Mill Creek Valley, I think there's a there's a different kind of complex. It's an emergent um, real estate capitalist complex that begins to to take control of the history with the um, with the destruction of the riverfront in 1939, and the idea being that by reducing the number of available commercial square feet in the city the existing square, the remaining square footage will be increased in value, right? Simultaneously, what happens after the Second World War is there is a um, emphasis very, very strongly in, in the thought of the um, political and economic and, and civic leaders, the, the white power structure um, emblematized here by Civic Progress, which is an organization that emerged concomitantly to manage the destruction of Mill Creek Valley. Um, the, 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 there's an emphasis on trying to figure out how to produce jobs for post-military whites. There's a lot of anxiety that runs through the nation, and this is again pronounced in the history of St. Louis about what's gonna happen when, when all these soldiers, when all these white soldiers come back from fighting the Second World War. What kind of jobs do they have? How are they gonna be re-domesticated? And so what we see then is first of all, the, the, the projects which produce jobs for people, the destruction of Mill Creek Valley, the interstate, the building of the interstate highway system. These are publicly supported projects to, um, to, to basically build a floor beneath the life conditions of, of, of post-military whites. That floor is elaborated through the GI Bill and through the FHA loan guarantee program into the foundation of white middle class life and suburbanization across the nation and um, particularly um, evidently and, and emblematically in, in St. Louis. Um, just to go forward, the, the, the Pruitt-Igo ha, has a different kind of relationship to the history of racial capitalism than does, say, Mill Creek Valley. What I see it happening at, at pruitt Igo is really um, the beginning of the usage of Black people themselves, rather than simply the space that they occupy, or rather than their labor. The beginning of the usage of Black people themselves as a resource, right? So what you see in Peru and I go is um, an enormous academic military industrial complex. Academic because you have a lot of people going into Peru and I go, a lot of money coming into St. Louis universities, um, particularly WashU, supporting research on Peru and I go that is meant to, to, to help outsiders sociologists, white people in general, understand what's happening with black people in the United States. Military, because of this, um, to me, extraordinary, perhaps simply because I uh, am or was naive, um, the, the radiological 
um, the, the testing of airborne radiological weapons on the population of Kuwait. Um, and, and finally, military because of the character of um, the emergent character of policing in St. Louis. And um, the, really in the aftermath of the Korean War um, is increasingly violent increasingly militarized and increasingly understood by the police and their supporters as being analogous to to military occupation or even even warfare the conquest of hostile territory um, finally, this particular aspect of the story of racial capitalism ends in North City and North County today, where what I suggest is, is that the African-American population, the poor and working class population of St. Louis has been um, rendered economically surplus through the, um, both through the, the movement of the economy, um, the, the economy of production offshore and the movement of the economy, the, the remaining economy in St. Louis. Um, and as well as being um, economically surplus, they have been um, municipally abandoned and rendered up for what I call a last round of extraction through payday loans, through for-profit policing, um, through for corporate welfare um, based on different kinds of tax abatements that are, are justified by the presence of urban blight, i.e. black people supported, um, are, are designed without any real consideration of those people's lives or, or aspirations um, in mind. And finally, through um, through mass incarceration, through a prison economy in Missouri, which basically um, uses uh, well, not basically, but but um, consequentially uses the incarceration of young black men as a um, jobs program and economic development program for rural whites in Missouri. Um, that last part of the analysis is drawn um, based upon the argument that Ruth Wilson Gilmore makes in Golden Gulag, which I really, really recommend to all of you as a terrific book. Um, I already feel like I have gone on too long, so I'm going to try and pick up the pace um, and say that I guess, you know, th these were sorts of things that I had thought I would discover in St. Louis. It was, these are the things I guess I went looking for um, when I set out to write a history of empire and um, anti-blackness. What I discovered alongside of them, what I guess I had known less about, perhaps I should have known more about, was the extraordinary radical history of the city of St. Louis. And um, it's that, that that became as much a part of the book as, as this history of imperialism and um, anti-Blackness. Um, and that would start with Native Americans who resisted the proletarianization of the fur trade with the Arikara, with the Blackfeet, um, who, who actually um, fought off St. Louis slave traders, I'm sorry, uh, fur traders in an effort to contain economic control, retain economic control of the trade. Um, continued through the, you know, I talk about the Black Hawk War and really use the Black Hawk War as a way to try to reflect upon the larger war on the plains, the larger history of, um, Indian Wars and expropriation. Um, but, but then, you know, the history of Dred Scott and of free black people um, like Dred Scott, enslaved people like um, the Madison Henderson gang, um, people who, who fought in different ways against the system of slavery, fugitive slaves like William Wells Brown, arguably the nation's um, first novelist, um, or Lucy Delaney, um, one of the very few, you know, I think four, actually four of the very few 19th century narratives um, published, it's slave narratives published in the 19th century 
um, come from, from women um, who were enslaved in St. Louis. And then continued up through the Civil War, through the actions of these um, actual communist Union Army generals um, and Union Army officers, I should say, Franz Siegel, Joseph Wedemeyer, in tandem with um, with William Fremont, who produced the, you know, led to the, the first general emancipation order in the United States in, during the Civil War, was issued in St. Louis in August of 1861, quickly countermanded by Abraham Lincoln. It's, but in, in Missouri, during the Civil War and in St. Louis, I argue there was a revolutionary alliance of radicals who were conceiving of the war as a war against property as a war against slavery and who were able to imagine, and this is particularly the case with Wedemeyer, a, um, a class alliance of formerly enslaved people and white working people and self-emancipated revolutionary African Americans, the, the, um, the protagonists of the, the movement that W.E.B. Du Bois referred to as, as the general strike. Um, and indeed, the most successful general strike of the 19th century in the United States occurred in St. Louis in 1877. Um, very, very briefly, for a very brief time, um, an alliance of African American and white, and even the category of white here is complicated by the fact that um, many of these workers were German speakers and um, had been born in Europe. Um, an alliance of all of these different types of workers controlled the city of St. Louis. They controlled the streets, they controlled which trains went in and out, and they were controlling production decisions of what factories would be able to um, employ workers on what terms. And so there was, for a very brief time in 1877 in St. Louis, um, a, an instance of what Joseph Wedemeyer, um, one of these uh, communist uh, army officers had termed the dictatorship of the proletariat. That was put down quickly, decisively by armed vigilantes, by state militia, supported by federal reserves. And um, the putting down of the, the strike of 1877 in a way culminated with the first Vail Prophet parade. Um, the, the emergence of the Vail Prophet in, uh, in 1878 as a way for the, the property classes to reassert their control over the, over the streets. Um, I argue that that radical strain um, remained strong in the city through the 1930s. Um, extraordinary history of communism in St. Louis and an extraordinary history of alliances between communists and African Americans. And even that is, is artificial because many African Americans um, and African American women were members um, and leaders in the Communist Party in St. Louis. This came out of the unemployed um, councils of the early depression, which successfully demanded um, better state support for, for unemployed people, um, food in, in hard times. I write a great deal about the Funston nut strike, which I consider to be one of the, 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 the a singularly important event in American labor history in 1933, where black women like Carrie Smith, who said, we believe that we are entitled to live as well as other folks live and should be entitled to a wage that will provide ample food and clothing allied with um, communists, with um, you know, the most, um, most notably William Suntner, and um, staged a strike against Funston Nut, which was the largest employer of black women in the city. I think there may, there may have been as many as 2,500 black women who worked for Funston Nut in 1933. And after a, basically a week long strike, they, they, the company folded and they got a new contract very close to the terms that they had been demanding. Um, I pushed that story up through the Emerson Electric strike of, of 1937, again a strike largely by white workers, but also black workers at Emerson, um, which went on for 53 days and was the second longest um, sit down strike in the history of the United States. A large portion of the book, and this is a, um, this 
this does, I think, also um, describe a large portion of my debt to, to Keona Urban and Clarence Lang and George Lipsitz focuses on the movements that of, of working class and poor African Americans in the city of St. Louis and on the economic character of the black freedom struggle in St. Louis. So there is in the civil rights historiography a um, a kind of a strain of sadness about the way that the mainstream civil rights movement focused on um, on on civic equality at the expense of economic equality, and I would argue that part of that um, reflects different you know different moments, different places, different emphases, um, but that the movement in St. Louis was um, always economic in character. And that's true whether you look at the Supreme Court cases, um, Noble versus Canada, education, Shelley versus Kramer about housing, Green versus McDonald about jo uh, jobs, Jones versus Meyer about housing, US versus Blackjack about housing. Um, but it's also, you know, th those are, those are um, by and large issues um, that concerned the middle class. It's also con um, it's also true of the working class movements of the, the, the colored clerk circle beginning in the 1930s or the March on Washington movement, which was particularly strong in St. Louis in the 1940s. These were struggles over jobs. Um, best remembered today, and this is where I'm really going to start to try to finish, is the um, Jefferson Bank struggle. Uh, in the summer of 1963. And what I wanted to, to do with the Jefferson Bank struggle is simply to try to, to um, exemplify why I want to talk about this as a black radical tradition rather than as a series of discrete responses. So for me, the, the, the person, the historical figure upon whom I, I focus in the Jefferson Bank struggle was Percy Green. This is really the moment at which Percy Green, who became um, such a galvanizing figure in the history of Black radical St. Louis, emerged. Um, but in front of Jefferson Bank, Percy Green was, was um, walking a line with Herschel Walker. And Herschel Walker is somebody who had moved to St. Louis in the 1930s and had become active in the Communist Party and eventually became the um, black chair of the Communist Party in St. Louis. So in front of Jefferson Bank, there's a linkage between those generations. But then if we follow that linkage forward in time, we can see the linkage to, to Jamala Rogers and to, to Organization for Black Struggle and to the Black Radical Congress, to the, to the Black Radicals of the 1980s and 90s. And we can also see that many of those who were on the street earliest and, and, and longest in Ferguson came out of the, the sort of uh, penumbra of, of OBS. Right, people who were were involved with OBS or were sort of OBS adjacent people, and so it's there, right, that that I believe you can actually see a set of connections that stretch from Herschel Walker to to Ferguson. That seemed enormously important to me, and was the story I was going to tell in my book until I did one of the last interviews that I did. With, um, with Percy Green, and we were talking about the effort to mount a general strike in 1979, I think, in order to protest the closing of Homer G. Phillips Hospital on the north side, a part of this process of municipal abandonment, the municipal abandonment of the north side that I could talk more about if you want. And um, I said, well, why a general strike? And Percy Green said, well, the, you know, the notion of the general strike was something that he learned about in reading about the history of the Vail Profit Organization, um, his longtime antagonist. Um, and, and he had learned about the general strike of 1877. 
from reading about the history of the Vail Profit Organization. And so all of a sudden then, there was a, a connection, a century long connection between the modality of resistance that he was using in relationship to the closing of Homer G. Phillips and this um, revolutionary uprising in, in St. Louis in um, 1877. So that's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that I have, have left out. Um, I would love to, to hear your questions. I am really, really grateful for you all being here this afternoon and grateful for, um, I can't say that I'm grateful for all of the engagement that I've had from the city of St. Louis, but I am grateful for the, the vast majority of it. And I, I look forward to your, to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And again, for everyone being here, it's, it's, um, it's always very revealing to learn the history of a place that you are living and working in. And we think we know these places, but then there again is this evolution. And if I can, I wanted to open up just to ask sort of a, a historical question in that St. Louis has really come on the map for many people, even more now, but yet your book brings us to and through 2014, which was a very different sort of political landscape. We've seen so many black bodies fall and we're now really having to reckon with even militia, this, this very centrality of violence and the evolution. And so I really just wanna ask how you are reckoning with 2020 and then yet how the broader public can then begin to even think about this history in the context of where we are in 2020, which is very much a pivotal decade, a changing moment in the full lexicon of our, our understanding. So again, if maybe you can sort of share with us as a historian and your writing of this, how you're reckoning with where we are in this, this global moment and a national moment. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I, I think in a way that the deep structures of um, capitalist exploitation and racial domination remain in place. And I think that's been evident through the, um, through the pandemic and it's been evident through the police violence. I um, am one who thinks of police violence as being a symptom rather than the problem itself. And so I think of police violence as a, as a symptom of the um, inequality in the society and of the um, inappropriate um, imperatives of the society, right? A society which wants to preserve um, private, or private property and a certain kind of public order, um, which is to say basically a white suburban gentrifier public order at the expense of investing in people, at the expense of um, investing in healthcare, investing in schools, um, investing in types of economic development that would support human flourishing. Um, and, and, a, and a society which is, um, on the whole, allergic to the notion of redistribution and is allergic to the notion of redistribution in a way that is um, expressed, experienced, and justified racially. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I will say that um, the, you know, my, my publisher has asked me to write a coda, a coda to the book about 2020 and um i'm thinking about taking the notion from marx's 18th brumaire which was a text that was first published by joseph vedemeyer this communist military officer who ended up in st louis that um history re is is um, repeated the first time as tragedy and the second time as farce and to focus on um the mccloskey's and the way that the, the McCloskeys um, have represented themselves as a victim to this existential threat to single family zoning, right? I mean, that, that's really what, what, what um, the McCloskey speech to the Republican National Convention came down to was, was a question of single family zoning. And Trump has picked that up. 
And so to argue that that's a sort of a um, bizarre echo of the long history of racism and real estate in, in St. Louis, a farcical repetition of that that's laid over the top of the continuing um, outrage that is um, the material condition of life for African-American and poor people in St. Louis as, as evidence, you know, by the, the disproportion, the, the disparate um, vulnerability to, to COVID, but, but the continuing um, situation, the, the continuing socioeconomic <laughs> situation in St. Louis. Thank you. Shanti is going to ask a question and then I'm going to follow up with some more questions that have come in from our, again, very gracious audience. So again, uh, Dr. Parikh, if you want to go ahead with your question. Yeah, um, Professor Johnson, thank you for that talk. Um, it was very illuminating. You actually answered one of the questions that I had, which is how do you refract the past through today? And I think your question about the McCloskey sort of answered that. But one of the questions that are in the chat that, that has come up a few times is, um, if you could reflect on some of the big factors that have caused the decline of the black radical left in St. Louis. Um, I'm not sure that I would want to allow that there is a decline, but I do think that um, COINTELPRO and um, I, I, well, I, I think, first of all, that anti-communism took a big toll on the left radical, the alliance of left and black and white radicals that characterized the 1930s and, and even through the Civil War years. And I think that's a story nationwide. Um, and I, I think the story of, of police violence and, and COINTELPRO and police harassment um, is another part of that story through the through the 70s and 80s. I think probably the the deeper story is a story of a separation between the black middle class and black working and poor people, and then the abandonment of um, black working and poor people, along with all poor people in the society. The the abandonment I would argue was justified as an abandonment of black working and poor people and then was carried over to all working and poor people in the society that, that we see emblematized in the municipal abandonment of, of North St. Louis um, and the, you know, the removal of the schools and the failure to address um, in any reasonable way the, the condition of, of the housing, the, the diversion of money that um, was intended for those neighborhoods to other neighborhoods in the city and eventually the, um, the land banking by the city and by speculators of large portions um, of, of North St. Louis in, in the hope of some sort of eventual speculative gain. Um, where I, I, I would, you know, I, I think, however, of St. Louis as a place where there are all sorts of um, black radical initiatives. And that certainly, I mean, I, I don't think of something like, like what happened in Ferguson or what happened in the aftermath of the murder, um, the acquittal of, of Officer Stockley and the murder of Anthony Lamar Smith. I mean, you know, in Ferguson, there were months and months and months of organized demonstrations in, in 2017, a full month under extraordinary um, circumstances, you know, really a kind of a, a, a rehearsal for the police riot that we saw across the nation this summer. So, um, you know, so, so in that sense, and, and, and also I think I, I point in the, um, in the epilogue of the book to a lot of what I think of as kind of prefigurative um, moments, movements, actions of, of, of black mostly and, and also white people in St. Louis that I think of as, as deeply radical and, and of expressive of the possibilities for 
for human flourishing more generally. Okay, so I have a question from the audience. In the middle chapters of the book, you mentioned the power of the press with German immigrants and working class activists. Printing presses were often targets of mob resistance. So the question is, with limited literacy in the 19th century, how did newspapers influence opinion and stir activism even more than today? Um, well, I, I mean, I think you have to imagine a, a culture that that is a, a culture in which pe some people can read and other people are in conversation with those people. And so there's been a lot of work on the intellectual early and modern periods. And, and a lot of that work emphasizes um, ideas that are discussed, texts that are read by, by more senior craftsmen in a shop to other workers, emphasizes um, civil society sites. I mean, in, in, in St. Louis and in, in German culture in the United States, more generally, the Turnverein was very, very important. Saloons, all of these places we need to think about as having an intellectual and political life, as well as um, just people sitting in their room reading the newspaper. I mean, very famously, the you know one of the things that that struck me was Stagley, who who shot a man over a Stutzen hat. Right, somebody who I have been hearing about all my life in in folk songs turns out to be a real character in the history of St. Louis. Well, it turns out that you know, part of the argument that he had with the man he shot was in a saloon and about Democrat versus Republican politics in the, in the 1890s. And so I, th you know, th this is not something that I have done the, um, I haven't done the research. I haven't done the right research to be able to answer the question as well as I would like. But I think that, you know, if, if for a moment we could imagine that world, um, I think we could do that. I have another question from the book. Having just completed your book, I found the book both deeply informative and a painful read, given that I am a native St. Louisan. The East St. Louis massacre was especially painful to read. St. Louis's character was influenced by pressures outside of the city. So the question is, how does its history and the development compare with other Midwestern cities, such as Chicago? Um, I, I think that, you know, the comparisons I would make more immediately would be to, to Cleveland and to Milwaukee and to Cincinnati. And I think that, and, and to Minneapolis. Right, and I think that, that one of the things that struck me about um, the, the uprising and that began with George Floyd and, and Minneapolis this summer was in many ways, not, not only how similar was the history of the city and its relationship to empire and anti-blackness, but how similar was the neighborhood to, to Ferguson. Um, I think that, that um, Chicago is, is a little bit different in the sense that um, I think that most people, and I, I think to some degree rightly, have understood the history of um, cities and commerce in the Midwest around a kind of a story of competition between Chicago and St. Louis in which Chicago was the winner. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, because of the railroad, and I, I think that the, the, the economic arc of St. Louis is more complicated than that. But I think that it's, it is difficult to argue with both the, the um, idea that Chicago is a more prosperous city today and, and has been since, you know, since 1950 or so than St. Louis. And that um, it is, I think, beset by um, many of the same issues, um, including the, the hyper-segregation that, that characterizes the city of St. Louis. Thank you. I think Dr. Parikh has a question for you. Yeah, so since I am monitoring the question chat, I just have, I'll, I'll ask two. Um, 
One of them is you could just mention very briefly, but I, I think now that we are all doing this Zoom, we are becoming intimate with the speakers in ways that we haven't. So somebody is asking about the picture behind you. And if it has, as a historian, if it carries any particular historical valence, they're saying they can't see the top of it. So somebody was curious about that as a historian. The second one um, is, and I'm asking, this, this is an interesting question, and I'm asking you because you are a senior scholar, but it's, a, it's about a critique of your work by Paul, Wagman, Paul Wagman's critique in the Gateway of Journalism Review that you made mistakes about important events uh, such as the rent strike, the Kirkwood City Hall, town, uh, town hall murders, Ferguson. Just curious, one, maybe you can let the audience know what was that critique, and two, what is your response? Yeah, so, so the, the artwork is by Carol Walker. And um, Carol Walker is, is I think, a, an artist who has, in many ways, taught me as much about the history of slavery in the United States as um, anyone, because her art bespeaks the, the unspeakable. Um, because it is a piece of art that's in my house, in my dining room, it's a print, and because I have um, small children, it is perhaps the least obscene Carol Walker, um, the least profane Carol Walker that that exists, and it's a, it's a representation um, of a of a hand lifting a ship out of the ocean. Um, yeah, Paul Wagman in the Gateway Journalism Review. So, um, you know, honestly. Um, I'm not particularly inclined to engage that. Um, it, it seemed to me to be a, um, it didn't seem to me to be a piece that had a huge amount of integrity as an intellectual engagement, to be perfectly honest about it. Um, it picks up some empirical errors and, and um, creates some, some innuendo um, the errors are, you know, there's two or three that are quite easily fixed in the paperback. Um, the innuendo is meant to suggest, I think, more or less, if you add it up, that I am um, unsympathetic to the well-intended efforts of um, white people like um, Abraham Lincoln, or like the city of Kirkwood, which said that after they had fined um, Cookie Thornton $20,000 for um, Picayune traffic tickets and, and um, what you might call um, created offenses that if he would not talk, if he would not critique the city of Kirkwood, which is to say if he would give up his constitutional free right to free speech, that they would generously forgive him the fines. So there's a sort of a tone that I have um, been unfair to well-intended um, white people. There's a little bit of a tone of paternalism um, to the review that, you know, maybe um, we shouldn't accept the testimony of people like William Wells Brown or Lucy Delaney and slave people in St. Louis um, that's, that slavery in St. Louis was particularly bad, or maybe we shouldn't read the book Bondage in Egypt, which, which emblematizes and specifies that history because local tradition has it that slavery in St. Louis was very mild. And I want to say, well, whose tradition, right? Um, it, it, you know, and, and it, 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 it just didn't seem to me to be particularly intellectually compelling, and I feel like I've actually already just said more about it than it deserves. Good, thank you. And actually, thank you for that answer, because as you know, St. Louis still is fraught with those sorts of questions. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, another one is, one, everybody's saying thank you very much for your presentation. So I just wanted to, uh, to say that. But somebody's asking, can you say a bit more about the two different forms of anti-Blackness you've identified in contrast? I believe you compared Southern US anti-Blackness to Western and broader racial colonial anti-Blackness. What are some other insights you can offer us um, in terms of racial capitalism from comparing removalism versus subjugation to expropriation and versus exploitation? But sort of, if I think the audience is interested in 
you know, your rich analysis of anti-blackness as it unravels and, and unfolds in particular locations and what makes ours particular? Yeah, so, so a lot of that comes out of my reading of um, W.E.B. Du Bois Black Reconstruction. And Du Bois, I think, is the one who really, um, for me, helped me understand the way that the, the sort of removalist anti-blackness, the notion of the white man's country was um, an ideology associated with a particular group of migrant whites non-slaveholding migrant whites to the West. Um, I think that's important and I think it's important to think about because one of the things that I have then tried to think about is the way that expropriation is an aspect of the history of racial capitalism in relationship to black people as much as exploitation. That's important to me because it helps me think about the present and it helps me think about mass incarceration. And so we have a critique of mass incarceration, which focuses on the notion of the prison industrial complex um, as if, you know, and it comes out of a historical series that would be um, the historical series you could imagine would be something like slavery, sharecropping, convict leasing, um, sharecropping still, mass incarceration. It's a story of economic exploitation, right? What, what I see in the history of St. Louis is the story of actually trying to exclude African Americans from the labor market from the end of slavery on right, to keep trains from coming to East St. Louis, right, which was a, a very strong movement among white working people in St. Louis, uh, in East St. Louis, a whole paranoia about the number of African Americans who were simply traveling in search of jobs like everybody else, as if they were somehow invading and taking away jobs that belong to white people. The exclusion, the, the exclusion of African Americans from the labor market that the colored, you know, the, the, the women of the colored clerk circle were fighting, that, that Percy Green was fighting when he climbed the arch or fighting at Laclede Gas or, you know, and, or, or at Jefferson Bank. This, this ongoing struggle for, for employment. Um, the white supremacy and racial capitalism in St. Louis were working through the exclusion of black working people rather than their exploitation. However, those very same black people were being expropriated for disproportionate rents, right? Which is, is what, what happens when you have a, a, um, a segregated housing market, um, cantoned into certain kinds of areas where the rents were higher and the maintenance costs lower. And then finally, when those areas became more valuable to tear down and sell off than the rent that could be extracted from them, removed. So again, there, there's, not a, there's not a labor exploitation, but there's an extraction, right? And that would be this, what I would argue about, about payday loans or about for-profit policing or about mass incarceration itself, that there's a, um, there's a different um, sort of modality of, uh, of racial capitalism that I think we haven't paid as much um, attention to as, as we should have. I think this question might be timely on a variety of levels. Um, this person actually wanted to ask, have you felt or experienced any effects from the statements from Trump about the, those who teach these truths about our country? Essentially looking at now how historians are being invited to almost create this very patriotic history. So have you seen, or if you wanna speak to both sides of you speaking about this history and the response given the a somewhat divided nation that we are faced with right now? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I've experienced all kinds of love and, and support, some of it from um, people 
in um, in St. Louis whose families were involved in in episodes I talk about, some people who were involved in episodes I talk about, and some who who appreciate the you know lifting up the legacy. So you know I've I've got you know I've got some hate mail, and some of it has a kind of a um, Trumpian rhetoric around um, violence. You know, nobody, I mean, I don't think anybody really honestly has forthrightly addressed the fact that I am actually a Marxist. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I suppose that, that um, when that day comes, you know, I'll, I'll, have, uh, I'll have something to, to answer for. Um, you know, I, I do think that the, you know, the, the, the demonizing, I mean, I think there's problems with the 1619 project. I think the 1619 project doesn't engage in the question of imperialism as much as I wish it did. And I don't think it has a kind of a historical topography around the history of capitalism that I think an analysis based on racial capitalism does. I think that the notion that what's being put forth in the in the 1619 project is um, so anathema that we have to have a new propagandistic history which um, emphasizes the actions of um, well-meaning white people and the um, the eternal character of of the values of the founders, I think that's um, I think that's dangerous, and I think that you can see it seeping into the ideology of um, well-meaning white people who don't understand themselves as um, aligned with Donald Trump. I'm going to sort of combine it, but I think this is a good place to. This is where we're thinking about the resources. So you're being asked about maybe some solutions to help change the future of St. Louis, but also thinking about if one were to get involved, if you want to maybe point to some other organizations that are bringing about change that you would want to inform our audiences about as we're really think, reckoning with, obviously, the, the convergence of many themes right now in our, in our living history. Um. I'm a, I'm a little reluctant to speak to ex cathedra about what I believe that people in St. Louis are doing because I think there are so many people in St. Louis who are doing so many amazing things. Um, those whose actions that I have found most um, inspiring have been the people involved with Close the Workhouse, Action St. Louis, um, Metropolitan Equal Housing Opportunity Council, the um, Arch City Defenders. I talk about quite a few of the people who I think um, for me are exemplary in, in the epilogue. Um, artists, you know, Tuff Poe, Dean Nichols, Damon Davis. Um, I'm in involved with um, some some different sorts of design collectives. I think that the one, um, I, I guess I'll say two things which seem to me to be, you know, kind of breaking my rule of not, not pontificating. I think that the, the Griot Museum of um, Black History on the, Black History and Culture on the North Side is a fantastic legacy institution and I would like to see the, the institution get more municipal support. I believe that that institution should be supported and that, that there should be support for black history and culture in St. Louis in the same way that um, there's support for the art museum and, and for the zoo and for the, the Missouri History Museum. Um, I think that there is a very, very rich history, um, black cultural history Black political history, black radical history, and I think there's very rich black history, black culture in the city today. And so I think that that, that would be something that I personally would like to see. Um, obviously, a lot of people talk about the city county split um, as an as an issue. I think that the the things with which I am most concerned are deeper 
than the structure of municipal governance. Um, it does seem to me, however, that you know there are places that have um, unified school districts and that a, um, a unified school district in the, between the city and the county would be a baseline, just a beginning place to, to start with, with kind of transforming the conditions of life throughout the city. I think that, you know, the closing of the, work, the workhouse, which is now, um, as I understand it from today's paper, being um, a little bit walked back you know, as an effort to, to walk that back. I think that's a, then interesting first step towards, um, I guess, an abolitionist future, which is something that I'm interested in thinking about. And, and I think that, that it, again, like I say, a lot of these um, tiny little fragments of the future that I try to identify in the epilogue are um, ways that, that I, I, I see the city um, pointing the way forward. Thank you. Dr. Parikh, do you have any other questions? Or sure. I will read some that have uh, also come in. I'm going to read one from a colleague of ours, um, Professor Ward. So he is interested in your thoughts on representations of St. Louis outside of the metro area. You mentioned its use recently at the Republican National Convention. Clearly, St. Louis, St. Louis has been used and abused, that is caricatured, caricatured around Missouri, historically to manipulate white politics. Or wondering when you think that begins. Also looking forward, do you think your nuanced counter memory of St. Louis can help shift our state's race and class politics and the stranglehold that the Republicans have on white, rural, poor, and working poor? And actually, we have somebody coming later in the semester who writes on white working poor um, in Missouri. So that would be oh. nice. And I mean, it's, it's a super complicated and, and interesting question. I think that, that, that some of that history, one could, you know, you could probably trace it all the way back at least to the the period of, of the Civil War where, or before the Civil War, where there was a slaveholding class in, um, in St. Louis, but there, the, the city itself was seen as more or less antagonistic to the institution of slavery. So antagonistic to um, Little Dixie in, in central Missouri and um, antagonistic, you know, so, so one of the arguments that um, is made about why Missouri was slow to build railroads and thus began to fall behind Chicago is that pro-slavery Missourians were wary of connecting St. Louis to Kansas City and thus to the West and thus facilitating the migration of um, people who were hostile to slavery, you know, i.e. both um, sort of free soil whites, but also Germans to, to the West. And so I think you could trace that back. I do think that um, in Missouri, and I think this is the case in a lot of the states in the United States that have kind of strong urban rural divides um, the politics around guns and policing are exacerbated by a, um, using images. I mean, this is really suggested by the question of um, mobilizing racialized fears of urban space and of black people in order to um, discipline um, working class and um, rural white people. And, you know, this goes to a, a larger sort of structure of, of thought of mine, which is, you know, part of what I think the history of racial capitalism shows us is the way that um, programs 
um, that are inimical to the interests of all poor and working people are introduced to, justified as, and represented as programs that are taking away benefits um, or are punishing or controlling poor and working class black people. And so I think there's a way then that um, the, the lack of the provision of adequate health care in our society or the um, lack of, of, of provision of adequate education in our society or the over arming and militarization of the police or um, the way that, that the, you know, the, the, um, the, the drug companies have, have manipulated the society into a kind of a profit taking cycle of overcharging. A lot of these things are initially allowed and justified as things that will only target a certain portion of the population, but then they are generalized to the entire population. So it is important to me both that um, black and native and trans people are disproportionately shot by police. It is equally, or, or it is also important to me that the training and overarming and over deployment and over policing in the society then results in the killing of all kinds of, of white people and straight people, right? So, so that's the way that I, I sort of see that relationship. I think that, that St. Louis um, did at the moment of the Ferguson uprising become the um, deserved focus of people's aspirations around um, around uprising. And I think in that way, you know, the history that I would write would be one in which um, Ferguson prefigured the uprisings of this summer. And um, honestly, that the, the, like I said, the, the response um, on the part of the St. Louis Police Department and the mayor and the police chief at that time and the governor of the state of Missouri at that time to the uprisings around Stockley prefigured the, the police riot that we saw this summer. Um, but I, I guess the last thing I wanna say is that um, I, I, it is my hope that, that some of the visionary you know, artists, some who I mentioned and, and some who I, I didn't know will you know, be, be among those who, who point our way to a better future. Great, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to, there, there's a couple questions in the chat about um, your take on education and sort of the future of our education system here. And you just mentioned education, so I will ask this one. So. It says, you mentioned St. Louis and the nation that is allergic to redistribution, which is you know, a brilliant phrase. This is especially exhibited in the multiple over 30 public school districts in the St. Louis metropolitan area and how these educational institutions have perpetuated racial capitalism and racist anti-black ideals. What are your thoughts about these, how these institutions can radi radically transform their curricula, discipline, policies, and culture to invest in hor historically Black communities that have been stripped of their rich culture and history? And I would also like to add just sort of the distribution of money and how we currently fund the education system based on tax properties, which is, has become such a naturalized thing, but is certainly a result of some of the processes you've discussed. Right. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a joke in St. Louis, right, that, that what, what, what all y'all do is when you walk around and you meet people from St. Louis, you ask them where they went to high school. And that's funny and interesting, but it is also indicative of the way that schooling in St. Louis is a proxy for socioeconomic status and origin. Right, the way that that is, is spatialized. And um, 
and I think that's you know I, I don't I don't think that's hugely different from the the rest of the United States, and I think that's tragic. I do think that the number of um, you know the the way that the school districts effectively map inequality tells us um, part of what the problem is, right? That's not accidental. Um, that is was at one point intentional. And now um, that intentionality is something that people can um, they they can disavow, but everybody knows what's going on because everybody's still going around asking other people where they went to high school. I think that the thing that you point to, um, which is an issue nationally, the um, way that um, school funding. Um, funding for education is pegged to real estate taxes is a hugely um, important issue. And it, it has to do not simply with the way that that produces um, inequality in school funding, um, but also then the sort of um, ways in which the politics of tax abatement and the model of, of economic development, the prevailing model of economic development in the society um, exacerbate that by um, giving real estate tax breaks to, to corporations. Um, that is, I think, a set of, of issues that are at once generally rendered arcane. People don't understand it as well as they should. And really, really exemplary of the way that racial capitalist privilege in the society, actually the actual privileges of property are reproduced over time. And so, you know, as a, um, as a first step in addressing that, both in St. Louis and nationally, it seems important to me to, to try to, um, to demystify it, to, to make people, you know, understand, understand what's, what's happening. Um, George Lipsitz has a line in, um, in his book, The Possessive Investment of Whiteness, which is about the um, enormous um, municipal subsidy that was given to the to the Rams on their stadium deal in St. Louis, where he says when the Rams won the, you know, when they won the Super Bowl, everybody can you know congratulated could congratulate Kurt Warner and the you know the greatest show on turf. But nobody um, stopped to congratulate the the um, school children in the city of St. Louis, whose um, dispossession had made that triumph possible, and and it's images like that I think that can help us um, begin to understand and communicate um, what it, the the way that our society is actually um, concretely organized at this point. Good. So um, I know you have a hard stop at 5.30. So uh, if a couple people are asked, are interested in what, uh, how, what, is your, what are your reflections on Corey Bush's victory over Lacey Clay after the family held that seat for so long? And what does that tell us about the contemporary moment, but also the future of St. Louis? And also, I'm going to put in the chat, not to self-promote, but we just edited, I'm an anthropologist, we just edited a volume that's actually looking at protest art from the Ferguson movement, and we oh, argue yes. that Ferguson is the birth of the 21st century Black movement. So if people are interested in that, the artists are great in it. So, but if you could just reflect on what Cori Bush versus Lee. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, a real interesting moment of the emergence of um, a black radical left tendency in St. Louis politics that I think is very exciting. And, um, you know, I, I think that I tend to be one who thinks that we need um, transformation of the society beyond um, currently imaginable reform. 
I think that, that Corey Bush is somebody who is thinking all the way to the limits of the imaginable and, and even beyond. And so I was, um, you know, I was, I was, I thought that was a really, really, with, with no, you know, disrespect to the long history of the Clay family and, and the Clay family's um, engagement, you know, in the era of Jefferson Bank, I, I thought that that um, that that was a really really exciting moment, and I'm excited to I'm excited to see what she does, along with the other um, radical young women in the in the House of Representatives. Um, there is you know, there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. There is a lot to do, and also just keeping with time again honoring that we all are evolving through COVID and really trying to accommodate a lot of changes. Again, Dr. Johnson, I want to say thank you for making time for us here at Washington University in St. Louis and also for those who are tuning in across the world. It is an honor and thank you for really being a remarkable kickoff for us as we knew to expect um, for AFAS. This was also co-sponsored with the Department of History and American um, cultural studies. So again, Dr. Johnson, we thank you for making time for us. And again, for all those who are tuning in, we have even more coming. We have a pre-election panel, Black Bodies, Black Vote, and we're also going to have a post-election panel. So stay tuned for a lot of even more intellectual engagement on a variety of levels that we can really all learn from. So again, we thank you, Dr. Johnson, and thank you to everyone who is tuned in and get ready for more. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you all. I hope to, to be able to get out there and see you before too long. We look forward to it. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you.